Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am delighted to introduce this virtual event with Jacqueline Winspear, presenting her latest Maisie Dobbs novel, The Consequences of Fear. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. I hope you're all well and safe. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and to our digital community during these challenging times. Every week we host events here on our Zoom account. And just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com and you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have any spoiler-free questions for the author at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we will get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I will be posting a link to purchase copies of The Consequences of Fear on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Harvard Square. We thank you so much for showing up and for tuning in in support of our authors and also of the truly fantastic staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And lastly, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings like these, technical issues may arise. We hope they do not, of course, but if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. We thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's author. Jacqueline Winspear needs little introduction to her many devoted <laughs> readers. She is the author of the New York Times bestselling Maisie Dobbs series, which includes the novels In This Grave Hour, Journey to Munich, and A Dangerous Place. Her standalone novel, The Care and Management of Lies, was also a New York Times bestseller and a finalist for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. She has won numerous awards, including the Agatha, Alex, and McCavity Awards, and the first book in the series, Maisie Dobbs, was also nominated for the Edgar Award for Best Novel and was a New York Times notable book. Her latest novel, The Consequences of Fear, is set in 1941. Freddie Hackett, a messenger boy for a government office, witnesses a murder, and in fear of his life, he seeks out Maisie Dobbs to help. As she investigates, Maisie must keep her cover as the special operations executive, assessing candidates for her work with the French resistance. Her worlds collide as she becomes entangled in a power struggle between Britain's intelligence efforts in France and the work of free French agents operating across Europe. Los Angeles Times praises fans and newcomers to the series will root for Dobbs and the other well-drawn characters, but the book's greatest lesson of all is not to shrink from fear, but to harness it. And now I'm honored to turn things over to our author. The digital podium is yours, Jacqueline Winspear. Thank you very much indeed. I love the, the, the words sort of technical issue because technical issues, because I sometimes feel that I'm a technical issue all on my own and dealing with computers and so on and so forth especially in different places because I'm doing a little bit of traveling at the moment so let me tell you a little bit more about the consequences of fear and indeed Freddie Hackett um, you know it's it's interesting that um, a few of my books definitely not all of them but a few have been inspired by family stories and when I say inspired the, perhaps the, the, the little spark, the little spark that, that something someone says has stayed with me. And from there, I've managed to grow a story. And that is certainly true of the consequences of fear. So let me tell you about that. And this is where I sometimes feel I should say, and are you sitting comfortably, just like they used to in those ch children's story times years ago. My father, um, my, when I first came to the, the United States, my parents, my, they're now both passed away, but mum and dad used to come and stay. And uh, they, would, they loved California, they loved coming to stay, they loved meeting my friends, then they'd go off to stay with my brother because he also lives in California. 
And one day um, we were in my kitchen and a group of friends had dropped round and we're all chatting away. And I was telling them what a fast runner my dad still was, uh, you know, even in his later years, really fast. And, uh, and that at school, he was, he was quite the sprinter. And uh, one of the things was that uh, probably had the war not gone on in the way, he would have gone on to do some pretty significant um, competitions in terms of, of athletics. Um, and one of my friends just looked at my dad and said, well, Mr. Winspear, you know, with a talent like that, were you a messenger in the war? And my dad suddenly, and I had never heard the story, looked up and said, well, actually, son, I was. I was a, I was a boy messenger. And I mean, I, my jaw just dropped. And this story emerged um, that my dad, yes, the fast runner at school, um, but even before war was declared, the ARP, the Air Raid Precautions Men, went around the schools and they were looking for the absolutely the fastest runners. And so they'd watch a class of, of boys run, um, you know, they're, they're over a hundred yards or something, and they would snap up the fastest one, just like that. And, and they were recruited. And after school, my dad reported to an ARP depot and he was given messages to run from here to there and whatever, and then given another message to run back and would work for several hours, often in the dark, often while bombs were falling, you know, running through through sort of with the searchlights going up around him and all sorts of things, making sure that messages got from one ARP station to the other. And I mean, I was just staggered by that. And the funny thing is, even though I was not a writer at the time, not a writer of fiction anyway, I remember thinking, there's a story there. And after I started writing the Maisie Dobbs series, I just had a feeling that one day I would come back to that. And sometimes you just have to wait because, you know, if, if that if that is the kindling, then, you know, you have to get you have to get more fuel on the fire. And of course, you know, history is always my muse. Cleo is the muse of history. And uh, it seemed time to go to the messenger boy. And so I created Freddie Hackett. Freddie is not like my father, except he can run. Um, Freddie actually runs messages for the between different secret service departments. He doesn't know exactly who he runs messages for. He just knows he has to turn up at a certain day. He's, or after school, he reports, he gets a, a message and he's told to take it to that office or that address or whatever. And sometimes they're private addresses. He just knows he has to get going. And uh, on this occasion, um, it's, it's night, it's dark. It's, there's a bomber's moon. So on what they used to call a bomber's moon is a full moon. And it used to light up the Thames into London. So the bombers knew exactly where to drop their bombs as they came over. But as Freddie is running, he sees um, a crime committed. He sees someone killed and it is terrifying for him. And uh, what happens is that uh, he's not believed by the police. He absolutely, I mean, ha has nightmares about it because he actually knows who the killer is, or he believes he knows who the killer is. He goes to the police, and the police at that point, they absolutely had their hands full. Even though um, the government were, were putting out stories, the press was full of stories about how everyone was pulling together. That was true to an extent, but there was also a lot of looting, there was a lot of crime, and there was a very healthy black market because by then, Britain is getting deep into rationing and, um, you know, there are certain things, sugar, for example, that you just couldn't get for love nor money. Um, and so, and also at the time, the police were losing men to the services. So they were short staffed. They didn't have time running around after a boy. They sent one copper out just to have a look at the area where he said he had seen someone murdered and there was nothing there. And so he was sent on his way. He remembers delivering a message to a woman in Fitzroy Square. And he remembers the plaque outside her office, which indicated what she did. And he remembered her kindness. There was something about her. And he thought, I'm going to go to that office, which he does. And I think that's all I need to say about that at this particular juncture, because I, I don't want to say any more because I don't want to give too many spoilers. However, I'm going to tell a, a little extra story 
which I only found out earlier this week through watching a documentary. Those of you that received my newsletter will have um, read about this because I found it so interesting. Here we are in this pandemic, we've all been locked down and a lot of us are going to streaming of movies and TV shows and what have you. And, you know, maybe watching things we wouldn't normally watch. Earlier this week, well, it's actually the end of last week, I was, um, I watched a documentary on that famous 1960s hairdresser, Vidal Sassoon. I, I kind of was interested in it because when I was about 12 and very impressionable, I must say, like we all, my, my older cousin who was a, just a few years older than me, absolute dedicated follower of fashion. I adored her. I, I, I wanted to be her when I grew up. She went to train as a hairdresser at Vidal Sassoon's. So I thought that was definitely the place to go to get your hair cut. Not that I ever did manage to get my hair cut there. But anyway, I saw this documentary on Vidal Sassoon and he had a very interesting life. Um, he was born into extreme poverty in London. He lived in a tenement, interestingly enough, very much like the tenement that Freddie Hackett lives in. Vidal Sassoon was also um, put into an orphanage because his mother wasn't able to keep him for a period of time. And then he was evacuated, just like my mother was evacuated out of London when war began. When he came back at the age of 14, which was the age that people left school in those days. You know, you, you were out of school and boom, you are in work. You, um, you didn't have any teenagerhood, not really. He came back from evacuation and he became a messenger. That was the job he managed to get, except he was a bike messenger. But it was so interesting the way he was describing riding his bike through the bomb sites to deliver these messages from different government offices and bombs falling and seeing the aftermath of a bombing. And all I could think about were two people, Freddie Hackett and my father. So that was, that was kind of interesting. Um, one of the other things you're going to find was, as you're reading The Consequences of Fear that Maisie Dobbs is, is finding herself at something of a crossroads. Um, and I think we all know how that feels and these crossroads, they come up somewhat frequently in life, don't they? And her crossroads is, is really that, you know, she now has a daughter and she is, she's adjusted her working week. So she only goes up to London a couple of days a week. She's trying to give Billy Beale more, more you know, authority, but, you know, she's, she wants to be involved in the major cases. But really, she's at this crossroads. Plus, she's being nagged about it by her stepmother. So there's this family interplay there. And... So you're going to find that Maisie is, is, is in, in fact, to a point where at, at one juncture, she walks away from what she's doing, her other job. She just tries to walk away from it. But of course, she can't because she's actually a government employee doing her national service, which everyone was required to do in one shape or form. And before I sort of leave you here and then we go to questions, I think it's, it bears saying that one of the, the, the great inspirations for me is always history. Cleo is my muse. I, I'm so curious about the, the period that I write about that I'm, I'm, I constantly love delving into it. And uh, it's amazing those serendipitous moments when you, you find something in your reading a book or your, your, your attention is drawn to a book perhaps as you're wandering through a bookstore and it's just the one you need at that moment. And for me, that, that happened actually in this, uh, writing this book. Um, if you remember in Maisie Dobbs, the first book in the series, uh, the woman that uh, Maisie follows, I'm asking you to cast your mind back a few years now, she lived in Mecklenburg Square. And I, I always loved Mecklenburg Square from the first time I ever went there, and I, I, I didn't know much about it, and yet I had to go and see a new client, this was when I was years ago working in London, who was based in Mecklenburg Square. And when I got there, I thought, this is a really interesting place. And so I, I endeavored to find out more about it. And so years later, when I wrote Maisie Dobbs, I set some of the action in Mecklenburg Square. And in this book, we return to Mecklenburg Square to meet a very unusual woman, someone who Maisie knows, but who's also a friend of her longtime mentor, Dr. Maurice Blanche. And it was interesting that after I'd finished writing this book, a, a, a book came out, a nonfiction book about 
the extraordinary women who once lived in Mecklenburg Square. And if ever you want to look it up, it's called Square Haunting. And it's a terrific book. But it was so funny to me, I thought, gosh, Mecklenburg Square keeps coming up and so on. And before I pass back to Nell, I do want to just underline something she said uh, with a comment I just made, which was, I was wandering through a bookshop and this is what I found. Because our independent bookstores are so important to us in particular, because I've always felt that they're very closely connected to freedom of speech. Because when you go into your bookstore, somewhere you know, like the Harvard bookstore, there are books by all manner of authors, the perhaps authors you might not normally be drawn to because you haven't heard about them. And yet you pick up a book and you think, oh yes, this is the book I want. It's not just sort of the latest, greatest. There are lots of other books there. And I think this is where we have so many voices and we're so blessed to have these bookstores that will always find you a book on a subject that you're interested in. So I really want to underline that and the importance of supporting our independent bookstores because I think they're fantastic. And with that, I think I'll pass back to, to, to Nell to see if we can look at some questions. All right, thank you so much for that. And yeah, we uh, do have a bunch of questions coming in. Um, so we have several that I'll kind of try and combine into one question, which, which is essentially, um, do you have an idea of, of how, how far into Maisie's life you would like to go with the series? Um, I do. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's fair to say that there's there's probably more there are more, there's definitely more behind me than there is in front of me um but one of the things that I wanted to do after I'd written you know Maisie Dobbs and then I was getting to work on the second book I was given the opportunity um well I gave myself the opportunity to really think about what I wanted to create in terms of a series because when I wrote Maisie Dobbs I didn't know I was writing a series I just had this book in my head that I absolutely had to write and then my what happened my then editor when the book went into production called me and said let's talk about the second book in the series and I thought oh, what's the second book in the series and it, it, it was it was a really funny thing and, and how I, I managed to get over that one <laughs> and very quickly what I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I did while I was writing Maisie Dobbs I was writing passages that you know, I suddenly thought, oh, that doesn't fit. But because we're wind spears are pack rats, it just goes with our territory. <laughs> we never throw anything away. You know, that goes having parents that live through the war, you never throw anything away. Mm. So I would save it in a file on my on my computer desktop marked fragments. So when I was asked that question and tapped dance around it, thinking, what am I going to do? But oh, I'll call you tomorrow and let you know. Mm. Um, I went to that file and I printed all my fragments and I put them all over the floor and I started to move them around. And I knew then I had the kindling, nothing more, just the kindling, but probably six more books at that point. Mm. And then I decided, and then I sat down to think about what do I want to create? And I realized that I, what I wanted was a series where not only was there an arc to each story and it's the, the, the mystery is the underpinning and that classical journey through chaos to resolution. But there will be a character arc for each of my characters. And then there will be an overall arc to the series because mm. I wanted to see how they interacted and grow and how they grow and change. And there, knowing that there were characters that would come in and then leave. They would, would and then maybe we'll see, uh, see a glimpse of them a bit later on, but you know, it's, it's, there, there are some sort of, uh, there are extras and then there's the main cast. Right. And so I would say, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I can tell you, I'm, de I'm, I'm not going into the fifties. I mean, she's not getting, she's not getting any younger right now. <laughs> and, um, you know, she's in her early forties and we've taken her quite a long way and she has a daughter and there is a love interest as we know. And, um, She's at a crossroads, so um, there's more to come, but I can't tell you how many there are at the moment. 
So really, I could have just said that in two words, couldn't I? But I've given you a really long <laughs> explanation because I thought the question deserved a longer yeah. explanation. No, I love that's yeah. I I love the image of all the fragments all over the floor and then. Oh, know. I tell you, it's never stopped since because I'm always doing that, throwing fragments into files and then dragging them all out. You know, I can I'm a bit I I can make a bit of a mess at times, but yeah, that's basically that's basically what I did. So I'm always, you know thinking, I mean, to me, character is all important. Um, and, you know, I, I, it was Elizabeth George in her book on writing, she said, you know, um, plot is character, character is plot. Yeah. And so if you, you, you know, you, you have your characters and you have your research, you have your historical underpinnings and you know what has happened, you know the case, you know what the mystery is then then I'm not saying it's, it's definitely not plain sailing, but you know the arc of your story and where you're going with those characters. Mm -hmm. But had, they will surprise you as well. I tell you, they do surprise you when they well, do they, things you don't expect them to do. You, someone asked if uh, you, you kind of start with, do you start with the kernel of the mystery first or do you start with the piece of history that you want to kind of unspool from there? Oh gosh, it's, it's really hard when you don't quite know how you do something. Um, <laughs> usually it's, there's, there's a mystery, you know, usually, not a mystery, usually there's a, a spark, there's something I've learned or something I've come across that maybe isn't a mystery, maybe isn't to do with a crime, but it sparked something in my imagination. For example, Elegy for Eddie, it begins with the birth of a child in the brewery stables. His mother is the un unwed mother who is this brewery stables cleaner. And he is someone who, he, and he is someone who because he was kept quiet, because he, he definitely couldn't make a noise because otherwise people would know what was going on. When he was born, um, He's, he's what people used to refer to as slow. Mm -hmm. But he had this wonderful way with horses. That was a story that my dad told me about someone he knew when he was a boy. And yeah. it always fascinated me when I was a kid. And I just came back to it one day. And, I, and this is where you go as a writer. You take something that maybe is not a mystery, not a case. But you then think, what if? Mm -hmm. What if? What if this happened? What if someone like that, um, you know, came across something that they didn't understand, mm -hmm. but it's really important? What if? I, yeah. as, I, as, as a writer, I spend a lot of time saying, what if? Do you mind if I just, I'm going to get up one second because I have to turn the heater off before I. Sure, I'm, uh, okay. <laughs> so. You do that and I'll check out these questions here. For, for the sake of the uh, the listeners, I'm, I'm actually in a hotel at the moment and the heat was really blasting. I thought, I'm going to explode any minute. It was, it's bad enough that you walk into a hotel and you breathe in all the fumes because of all the cleaning liquids. You know? it's, yeah. So. I mean, there's a story right there, isn't there? You know, the dead body on the floor because they've inhaled too much, too much hand sanitizer. Who did it? Oh, it was COVID. <laughs> <laughs> but not in the way that you think. Not in the uh, way that you think. <laughs> we've uh, we have a couple of questions uh, that are asking about um, Maisie's uh, mindfulness techniques and her meditation, and are very curious about this element of her character and kind of how sort of ahead of her time that is. What gave you what gave you the idea for that? she was not ahead of her time. This is the thing. We, we all think that yoga meditation so on was invented about 30 years ago in Los Angeles, you know, right. and, and it wasn't, it absolutely wasn't. I mean, look how many thousands of years it goes back, but here's the interesting thing. It, it is of the time. And I'm just going to pull together a couple of aspects of, of social history here um, that all came together in a way. And that is towards the end of the 1800s, um, there became a great interest in spiritualism, and that happened on both sides of the Atlantic, right. um, which led into an interest in spirituality. 
And then you went into the early 1900s. Now, remember that Britain had an empire. The jewel in the crown was right. the Indian subcontinent. Yeah. There were cases of, of British soldiers in India going off to sit on mountaintops with their, going AWOL to sit on the mountaintop with their guru. Hmm. And of course, many, um, there were many government officers there and their wives and children, the children often raised by ayahs who, were, who would teach them um, basic yoga because that's, that was something that was taught to a lot of people. And then they would, um, and then there was this great interest in Indian, Indian spirituality in the early part of the uh, last century. Mm -hmm. I have found books literally on, on um, mindfulness and yoga going back to about, and I, I bought a couple that I found in, you know, used bookstores going back to 1904, 1909 and so on. Um, and so the, the people that Maisie was being introduced to by Morris were what we might today call the chattering classes. And they're just the sort of people that would have gone for something like that. Alternative ways of thinking. Now, loop that into the fact that, you know, Freud, I think it was, um, you know, the work of Freud and Jung was very present in the early 1900s. I think Jung wrote his doctoral thesis in 1904. And then Maisie, when she went to Cambridge, to Girton College, she studied the moral sciences. Mm. Modern psychology was part of that. So you know philosophy was also involved. With, you know, and you think of these, these people that she would have met, and particularly through Khan and you know, Morris, you, you understand his background. Yes, this is something she would have learned, but he recognized in her that sensitivity, which gave her an openness mm -hmm. to what she was being taught. So she was able to, to um, really, how can I say, get the most out of it. it. She really found it useful as a younger woman. Um, it helped get her through her experiences in France mm -hmm. and it helped her with her recovery. And now it helps her to center herself and to really almost move inward so that she understands better what's going on outwardly. Does that make sense? So she wasn't ahead of her time. She was very much of her time. It's just that, you know, we've got, we think it was, you know, look at Joseph Pilates. People think that's all new. Right, right. Joseph Pilates developed his methods while in a prisoner of war camp in 1917. Hmm. And he was then, um, and here's an interesting factoid for you that he, um, he wanted to keep all the other, um, there were a lot of, uh, the, the, the prisoner, of, it wasn't actually a prisoner of war camp, it was an internment camp on, on the Isle of Man um, uh -huh. for people of German heritage, which is what they did in the, in the First World War because they thought everybody might be an agent. And he started to make, to make sure that people remained healthy in there. And they were fed you know, for the day quite well, but he had them doing exercises and he was really working with people because, and also he was teaching himself. He was working out what works and what doesn't. Now he came, here's when he came to the attention of the British government. No one in that camp went down with the flu when the flu epidemic went through. Oh. Yeah, there you go. And uh, doesn't that resonate? Huh. And then what they did, they pulled him out and they asked him to work with um, war wounded. Oh. So he, he's, he actually honed his methods working with uh, wounded soldiers. And then of course he later moved on and he came to America and so on and so forth. But yeah. that's where he honed his methods. And what do we think of Pilates? Oh, another thing that was invented in LA 30 years ago. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, to have been in LA 30 years yeah. ago when all these things were invented. <laughs> <laughs> I I had no idea about Pilates. I mean, yeah, I mean, of course, with yoga, that makes sense. And um, actually, I wove that story into Birds of a Feather. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so about no. Pilates. Okay. I love, to, I love throwing in little surprises like that. <laughs> when I find out something, I think, oh, I can't leave that alone. It's, it's like, a, it's like, you know fallen fruit i just have to pick it up and weave it in right no absolutely <laughs> um we we have a couple of questions that are uh about um how how your memoir did your memoir kind of 
feed into the Maisie Dobbs series at all or sort of is there any kind of anyone in your family no. who inspired I mean you've been talking about the family stories that are sort of yeah planned. no no one in my family my character is not inspired by my family my goodness me I've got a, such an <laughs> I've got such an extended family they'd all come around with bats to hit me over the head right. you know? <laughs> so, oh, I, I recognize myself in that one you know um, um so uh, the, what I guess what the thing well first of all no one in my family appears in, in the books there are snippets of store of stories that I've heard say from my parents mm -hmm. or another family member that even if they, they you know have inspired part of a story you know so that one little snippet um I'll give you another example. One of my aunts, um, after a horrible bombing raid, she was 15 working in a factory. She, um, the factory was bombed. She was sent home, having to walk over fallen rubble and, and so on. And seeing the, uh, and this is what people saw every day, the aftermath of a bombing. And eventually she saw her, her, her father and, my, and her sister, her sister's my mother, was my mother, walking towards her because they came to look for her because they knew they thought they knew the factory had been hit and they were really worried because in case she was uh, wounded or even worse but anyway as she told me that as she was walking along she saw this woman on top of a big where the house had come down with her bare hands with the hot rubble trying to tear it back and she was screaming my girls my girls my girls are under there i wove that little snippet into the start of the American, uh, the American agent, because I just, it was so vivid and so telling of the sort of thing that people saw, I had to weave it in to the opening scenes. It's not only a paragraph, it's only a paragraph. Mm -hmm. So, you know, regarding my memoir, you know, that's not in my memoir specifically, but family stories, how, you know, my, my memoir did not inform you know the fact it, it, it you know i've got no book that's all based on my family story it's a snippet or there's an aspect of character about someone that somebody knew like eddie pettit from mm -hmm. um elegy for eddie and that particular story um and others are um so and, and also you know things like the uh you know when i was growing up the fact that um in i i grew up in a very rural community and quite a, 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 there were quite a few women there, of ladies of a certain age, the seniors in our community when I was a little girl, who were miss, miss this, miss that, mm -hmm. miss the other, you know, because the men they might have married were killed in the First World War. Mm -hmm. So they had lost their sweethearts, they might have lost their young husbands. And there was a lady who lived at the end of the road, she used to take me to Sunday school, and she was a miss. She lived at home uh, with her um, older sister, and they were, gosh I mean I don't know how old they were then but they were all grey I'll tell you like I am now <laughs> and um and her sister had she had lost her young husband in the war the lady who took me to Sunday school she had lost her sweetheart and the brother was in a wheelchair because he had been wounded in the great war mm -hmm. so that was around me as a kid and you know my grandfather had been wounded in 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 the great great war and so on and I knew the Second World War history. I mean, you know, it's it's as a child. Mm. Were you? And this is just. I'm curious hearing that. Were, were you hearing those stories as a kid? Because I mean, my my experience from from uh, folks who were say in my peer group or a generation older that that the notorious thing was that their their fathers never talked about their experience in say world war ii That's or true. one of these things that they would you, you know you would only hear it sort of at the very end of their life or or you know suddenly you know you're an adult and and the moment sort of strikes but were you hearing these stories even when you, um, were, you were a child my, my certainly my grandfather never talked about it i knew of his wounds because i saw them mm -hmm. and uh, in my memoir i talk about some things that i witnessed as a child uh, which were very telling mm -hmm. um he only ever told my father um, two stories uh, and, uh, and not even stories. One actually worked its way into um, Messenger of Truth, 
but and it, one wasn't a story. It was just about how, you know, everyone will be lined up in the trench waiting to go over the top. And one man had the power to send them over the top, the man with the whistle, which was the sergeant to send mm -hmm. them going. And, uh, and they all got their mother. And, and that image was phenomenal. My grandfather was severely wounded at the Battle of the Somme. Mm. But what happened is after he enlisted and he was at um, the first Battle of Ypres, Plug Street, what they used to call Plug Street Wood. That was his, and uh, because most of the people in his battalion were killed, he went on to do stretcher bearer duty for a while. Then he had to re-enlist. It was a very strange, because he had to go to a different regiment. But oh. while he was on stretcher du duty, uh, stretcher bearer duty, he um, came across the bodies of a, a Brit and a German and they had died instantly mm. together. And that, that, st that stayed with me. And I knew that it was probably in my very early teens. But as a child, um, it's not that people talked about it, but certainly my mother told me a lot of things about war and her experience of war. But, you know, my mom came from this big extent, you know, she had nine siblings. And they all, you know, converge on the house at once. And they would talk to each other about their memories. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if they were blabbing to people outside the family, but I think they felt a comfort in talking to each other. And of yeah. course, if you're the kid sitting under the table, eavesdropping, you hear it a lot. You know, and I was, a, <laughs> I've got to tell you, I was a terrible eavesdropper. I mean, I'm, I was, um, little miss, Why you are I, mother, right? <laughs> I, I was an eavesdropper. And in fact, I even wrote one of my no newsletters lately of referring to myself as little miss nosy, because I, I think I was quite nosy really. <laughs> you know, whenever we went anywhere, my mum would always say, now keep your mouth shut. Don't keep asking questions. <laughs> You'll show me up, you know, um, but you know, that's the curiosity. And I think, I think, behind every writer they might not all admit it as readily but I bet you there's a lot that would say the same thing and they or they find out things in other ways you know but right. uh, I, I just flat out ask questions you know <laughs> so um so yes yeah, they, yeah. They, in the memoir there's there's quite a lot of stories but um it wasn't that people always talked about it it's just that I found out that you were yeah you know, huh? yeah yeah how uh speaking of how how do you approach the historical research in your books? We have an Emily Weddle asking. About. Right. Um, it, it depends what I am, what I need to know. And at this stage, in the even when I started writing Maisie Dobbs, I had a, um, because of my curiosity about the time I write about, and particularly women's history, I already had a grounding, let's say, and I already had materials being books mainly. But I then obviously when I started writing Maisie Dobbs and, and more actually when I started the second book in the series, I, I, I was, and actually Maisie Dobbs as well, what am I thinking about? But I was doing a lot of field work. So when I went to the UK, there was, there was always things I wanted to know. And uh, I would go to museums, I would consult archivists, I would walk everywhere that Maisie needed to walk to remind myself. And of course, what you have to do in London is look up yeah. because chances are the building that was there in 1930 has now got a plate glass window and it's got H&M written across yeah. the top. But right. if you look at the top, you see the original building. Mm. And, um, and also remember London was changed dramatically in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, so streets changed a bit, some streets ceased to exist. So um, there are resources that I have to hand such as a historical tube map of London. I have old maps. I have maps from before the Second World War and maps during the Second World War. So I have all these things that I can draw upon. And, but when I start each book, I, um, I start with, I have three, of those big poster sized post-it notes and I slap them on the wall. And once to keep track of the characters because I do change names as I go along. I think, no, 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 she is not a Lydia. She's <laughs> a Rachel, she's definitely a Rachel. You know. And then I keep track of um, often dates when things need to happen. Um, actually what I tend to do with that, I, I, I do an arc 
And that's the arc of my story. And I put landing points on it. This is the extent of my preparation. Mm -hmm. And then I have another post-it note and things I don't know that I need to know that I have to find out come what may. Yeah. So um, at the moment I'm writing an, another book, which will come out next year. And suffice it to say, there's some information there that was really hard to come by because it was so classified at the time. Yeah. Eve, believe it or not. And it, there was one date I was looking for and my goodness me, <laughs> I actually had to, I actually know where it was that date printed. I had to figure it out. And it, uh, and it, so that was interesting. So how do I go about my research? I go about thinking, what do I need to know that I don't know? But here's the most important thing about research, and I, which is why you know, particularly when um, uh, uh, people that want to write their first novel or whatever, and it's historical or, or whatever it's about, get, getting into research is that just because you've done it doesn't mean to say you have to use it. Right. <laughs> If you're, ba if, you're, if you're baking a cake, just because you've got whole pots of spices and things like you don't have to throw it all into the cake. Yeah. Just because you've got a whole brand new container of herbs, you don't throw them all into the soup, do you? No, you just, you just season. Mm -hmm. That's how research should be used. It's like an iceberg. Only 7% of it should be visible above the surface. I often have spoken to writers who it's it's a case of because i've done it i'm going to get it all in you know and right. you, here's the thing you have to trust that it informs every word you you think you're not using it but it informs every word it informs the way you structure a sentence the way you structure dialogue because people back in the 1930s and 40s did not use quite the same language had slight differences my grandmother would not have said, I will go to the shops today. She would have said, I shall go to the shops. Yeah. She wouldn't say, I'll do that. I'll do that soon. She would say, I'll do that presently. Presently. Uh -huh. These words that we don't use so much anymore. Yeah. And then there are phrases like, um, rather than say, I wouldn't exaggerate, they say, well, I wouldn't over egg the pudding if I were you. So <laughs> you bring all these in, which gives a sense of time and place. Yeah. But the key is to, uh, which is why I actually like to read um, particularly memoir written at the time and, uh, and also other fiction written at the time, not the sort of fiction that I'm writing, simply to get the sense of rhythm of the language. And you have to be careful with that as well. Otherwise, people sometimes don't understand, you know. Um, actually, Cara Black gives a wonderful example. And that is she's always asked why her her policeman in Paris, uh, why she doesn't call them gendarmes. And, and she always says, because they're not called gendarmes. They're, that's for the country. In, in France, this is what, who they are. They're the police. They're not, the gendarmes. They're not gendarmes. Right, and, right. And it's right. such a great, a great example because it gives um, a sense of what the reader's perspective is from mm -hmm. reading other books, their knowledge, you know, and they expect you to have this, you know, I mean, and I know I'm sort of going off a tangent here, but this is all to do with research. I can remember when I first used the word smog, I was told, believe it or not, smog, here we go, back to LA, wasn't used un until the 1950s and 60s in Los Angeles. And I said, well, actually it was used in 1905 in London, you know, to, to describe that noxious blend of smoke and fog. And fog, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so how do I do my research? All sorts of ways but I can break it down to primary research and secondary research. Primary research, just like marketing in business. Primary research is that which I do myself, walking battlefields, walking streets, going into archives, going through letters, going to the Imperial War Museum archive, that sort of thing. Or primary, uh, secondary research is the stuff that people have done for me, which means going to books mainly, mm -hmm. you know. Are there, uh, which, which authors do you enjoy reading or are there kind of preferences, especially for say the fiction written at the time or historians? That oh, you um, well, oh gosh, can't think of anything specific at the moment, but you know, um, today, for example, um, 
I was listening to to um because I've been on this journey um driving um a, a, bo a book about nature basically and walking and the writer was talking about um a well-known uh prose poet um and like many young men after the First World War, literally walked and walked and walked. So I, I immediately want, thought, oh, I want to order that. I want to order his poems. I want to see what he wrote, you know, and how he observed his world. Um, so, uh, but, but in terms of, um, I mean, one of my favorite authors, if we're talking about mystery, is, is Louise Penny. I love her work, you know. And, I, she's always a treat because I don't read fiction while I'm writing fiction and her books usually come out when I've finished writing the fiction or something so I can treat myself to a Louise Penny. I think she's terrific. Nice. Um, but, you know, it really depends. I mean, I'll pick up books that I know I'm not going to use specifically in my research, but it's kind of like background reading. There was one book I read just recently called Dressed for War and it's about British Vogue during the war years it's fascinating you think it's all about fashion but it's nothing to do I mean it's hardly anything about fashion in there what was in there was more the the work of this terrific editor who had to create Vogue apart from quite apart from the American influences because in the war um, because you've got British women were were, were experiencing war on their own soil american women weren't there were things that british women just weren't interested in and couldn't get interested in because they clothing was rationed right, yeah <laughs> but, no but, you know yeah. she absolutely this uh, this editor um i'm trying to remember her name audrey withers something like that mm -hmm. she um completely launched um uh oh gosh what's her name the famous journalist lee 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 lee, lee. oh it's gone right off my head probably because I'm thinking too hard. It'll come to me, you know, Lee. Okay, famous <laughs> Second World War journalist. Mm. Everybody out there saying, we know who it is, why can't <laughs> you remember? It's Lee, you know, Lee who lived down in Sussex and I can see her picture right in front of me. And uh, cause my, she's- Lee uh, Miller, I'm, someone's saying. Lee Miller, thank you, thank you. <laughs> see, I knew it all along. I just wanted to make sure people were on their toes. <laughs> But anyway, that was that's the kind of book that I pick up. It's the kind of book I delve into. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Um, let me see here. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Sorry, I got so wrapped up. You were trying to think of Lee Miller's name. <laughs> <laughs> I was scrolling down really fast. So maybe maybe someone fed in the fed in the name. Uh, da -da. Uh, someone saying I started consequence of fear last night at nine i finished it at 2 30 a.m <laughs> oh my goodness me well done well done she, um, she liked it <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. uh any plans for other standalone books yes yes indeed and i will be writing a, a standalone book when i've finished this one um and it's uh uh that interestingly enough that's that's one based uh, uh, sort of upon a, a, one of my own experiences in childhood but it is it's set in the immediate post-war period in in london um mm. but uh, so that uh, you know it's a case of watch this space it will be coming not next maybe probably not next year probably the year after we'll see who knows i mean if, if locks down locks down lockdown start right. again you know in a big way <laughs> Yeah, I'll be time might as well, you know, I might as well write it. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, there we go. There's someone asking, are there are there aspects of are there decisions that Maisie has made about her life that have surprised you or even frustrated you? Um, or where are are there characters that may have gone places that you had not anticipated? I don't know if that gets into too spoilery territory. Um uh, I, I think what this is is about is when when characters do something that surprises us, um, and I can point to uh, gosh, I think it's pardonable lies. When I had the plan, I knew exactly where I was going to start the book. It was going to be that you know, um, uh, Lord Julian Compton. It was his friend who's the Q, uh, sorry Casey King's Counsel, and uh, you know. 
wants to know what happened to his son in the war, blah, blah, blah. And then Maisie was going to go in and um, he was going to ask her to look into it. And that was going to be the start. I sat down to write that day and I wrote something else completely and utterly different that I did not plan, did not expect. And it started with Maisie being called to Vine Street Police Station where a young girl has been accused of murder. They believe her to be a young prostitute and she's been accused of killing her, the, the, the man that uh, led her into it. And Maisie goes into the room and, in, and they, she will not say a word. She's absolutely not saying a word, this girl. She's just sitting there in absolute silence. So Maisie is called in because the police believe that maybe she will be able to get her to talk. She do, Maisie does not try to get her to talk. Instead, she asks for a bowl of hot water and towels. And she goes to her knees and she washes the girl's hands and feet for her. And so she begins to open the girl. Mm. And it was a really interesting thing because I thought, I remember thinking, well, what have I just written here? And I know what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna go with it because that's what you have to do. And I think almost every writer has had that experience. Mm -hmm. but they might not all admit it like I have, but everybody has had that experience, I reckon, which is where you just have to go with what the character's doing. And in doing that, I was able to explore in character, as, as, as Maisie went through this, this case, that she um, explore her, her, her grief at losing her mother at an early age. And because this is basically a motherless child that she's, uh, that she's washing her hands and feet. So, so that, that was something that was unexpected to me. Um, and uh, I, I think that's really, uh, if you can tell me the actual question again, because that was the closest I could get to the answer, just in case there's anything else I need to add. Sure. Um, they asked, oh, I might have moved it into the next. Not to worry. But, but yeah, essentially, if there, if there are any decisions that have frustrated you that Maisie had made. Well, or... you see, here's the thing. When, if Maisie frustrates me, all I need to do is bring in Priscilla. Priscilla. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's why she's such a great character, Priscilla. Is she? She's a character of depth. She has her own. Um, she has her own. Um, she's got her own following, definitely. But she's always the one to pull Maisie up short. She's the mirror. She's the one that says, Maisie, you know, what, what are you basically? If, if she was now, she'd be saying, "What are you thinking? You know, going out dressed like that in that black dress again? My, don't you have color in your life?" She's, she's. <laughs> She's really, you know, I, I, if, if Maisie's frustrating me, I, I go to one place either now, either Brenda, her, her stepmother, or sometimes her father, because her father's not shy about, you know, talking to her. He's very careful, though, very respectful. But Priscilla, give her a gin and tonic and she doesn't care what she says. You know, <laughs> that's what I like about her. <laughs> She's a foil, so to speak. Yeah. And let's see. Oh my gosh, we have so many great questions and we're about at time. Um, but uh, one, so I think this, maybe we'll close on this. We'll see. Uh, but Delia asks, uh, what, what attracts you to mysteries? What attracted you to writing mysteries? A um, couple of things. Number one, Although when I first wrote Maisie Dobbs, I didn't sit down to write a mystery, but because she was automatically a, an investigator, it became a mystery. Here's what I love about mystery. I love the journey, that, that process of going through chaos to resolution. I think that you can explore all manner of social and historical and environmental, et cetera, et cetera, political ills through that journey from chaos to resolution. Having a series means you don't necessarily have to do all the resolving right there and then. You can carry, you know, things that can still continue. Although one has to be fair and honest with the reader, you know, and that, 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 that the book can come to a beginning, middle and end. The other thing I like is that I can have a series, which means I have a much more authentic relationship with the characters. Um, and I'll give you a very quick example because I know we're pushing on time here. And that is that if I met you in a coffee shop 
and we started chatting. We thought, oh, well, you know, we get on pretty well. Let's go for a walk together. And then maybe later we'll have lunch together and then another cup of coffee, another walk. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't tell each other everything about each other in that first meeting. You reveal yourself over time as you trust someone. And the great thing about a series is that you can, as the character, as you create the character over time, so they can reveal themselves to you. And I've done both because I published the care and management of lies. And so I've done that where I've, I've explored the character within the confines of one book, although I have to say, I would love to go back to that and do a sequel because I've got it in my head. But, um, but the most rewarding thing about a series is that it has, it's, it's very organic and natural in the way that you would get to know um, the people that you meet and the people you become close to whether you like them or not you know I, I mean I lucky I, I like Maisie she, I find her a bit frustrating at times you know because she's very clever she's much cleverer than me <laughs> you know and um but I like all of them and uh, in their own way and I I'm always curious to see what happens to them and I think that that is a lovely thing to to uh, for, uh, for, for a body of work to give to you as a writer. And that is the curiosity about the characters. Mm -hmm. So that's it. It's very organic. That's why I like mystery. And I, I love that. I think it offers you so much that journey through chaos to resolution. Mm -hmm. It really does uh, as a writer. And uh, I think that, um, I think it's completely underestimated in the literary world, which is why I don't tend to refer to mystery as a genre. I refer to it as a literary form, because I think it's, uh, I think it, it, you know, it, it's a tr traditional form of storytelling. It goes right back to the myths and legends. Right, right. Yeah. And who couldn't use resolution and chaos right now? <laughs> and, and isn't that the truth? And you see, that is why people love mysteries right now, because all is well all becomes well and here's something about the historical mystery it adds to it because people look back at a time that was fraught with danger fraught with terror and filled with grief and we think you know what we're all still here today people came through that mm -hmm. people came through it my grandfather came through the war my grandmother came through the war so did my parents people have come through depression the depression hit so hard in america other wars have hit hard in America, but people came through it. It's the will to survive and to flourish is totally in our DNA. Otherwise, we'd, otherwise there wouldn't be a human race, would there? Right, right, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah we'd... okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. Uh, I oh, thank you so much. This is delightful. And thank you to all of you for joining us. I just reposted the link to the book. So go go learn more and purchase copies of the latest Maisie Dobbs. And uh, again, Jacqueline Winsphere, thank you so much. Well, th thank you, Nell. And thank you very much, everybody who sort of tuned in and followed the conversation today. It's I'm sorry I couldn't answer all the questions, but I really appreciate you being here and, and supporting this great bookstore. It's terrific. Okay. Take care. Take everyone. care. Bye. Bye-bye.